wonderful old song you did. How many of y'all remember that from childhood? Yeah. And I think it's a wonderful way to welcome ourselves in and welcome God's Spirit into our lives this morning. And we thank you for joining us online. Uh, and we appreciate your uh, coming and joining us in worship. As we begin worship this morning, there's just a couple of announcements. First of all, the um, knit pickers are going to meet on uh, Tuesday morning at 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Then on Wednesday night, we have our Wednesday night Bible study. And we're going to be studying the last part of Daniel 11, verses 21 through 45. So uh, please join us for that. We'd love to have you. Uh, to be a part. The next Sunday, 10.30 in the morning, we're going to have the third Sunday in Lent, and uh, we will be having uh, worship at that time. So put that on your calendars and join 10 us. 10 o'clock, right? 10 o'clock. Uh, did I put another you said, time? No, you said 10.30. Oh, 10 o'clock. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I, I've slept since that time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You people in your comments. Okay, yes. 10 o'clock next Sunday. Please join us. All right. Do we have any birthdays or celebrations? I know one. Someone told me about it this morning. Grant. Grant. All right, Grant. And how old did we turn? 25. Ooh. Oh, it's only a fifth of my life. <laughs> only a fifth. 25. I mean, can anybody remember? I I guess, I've heard that more than 25 years. <laughs> One score in five years. Oh, don't go there anymore. <laughs> I don't do scores anymore. All right, let's sing happy birthday to this one. Jesus that we follow. Jesus. 
What kind of Messiah is Jesus? He is the Messiah who teaches that will lose his life and who calls us to lose our lives in order to save our lives. How does it feel to follow a Messiah whose teachings and call are so hard and uncomfortable? Some feel fear and anger, while others feel uncertain and anxious, and still others feel resolved and ready to follow. Little travelers, we are not alone in our feelings about following Jesus as the our Messiah. It's a hard road. The blessing is that we do not travel it alone. Thanks be to God that we share this journey with Jesus and with one another as we lose our lives for the sake of the gospel to save our lives in Jesus, Messiah. Amen. O oh, worship the King, the glorious of all, number 73 in your living hymnals, and we'll sing all the verses. Thank you for loving us 
Open our eyes to see those who are hurting, that we may help them in all we do. In Jesus' name, and let's all say, Amen. Amen. All right, person, you know what to do. All right, you better have your dollars. Yep, wave them. Okay. Uh, for Woody and 
uh, Thelma Eisenhart, okay, uh, for uh, Lucy and Bruno, uh, Cheveria, that is my uh, biological mom, and uh, she w moved into uh, another rehab center, so we're thankful for that. And then for Deborah Cowan's mother, uh, we didn't have her name, but um, she asked for prayers for her mom. Uh, we want to remember Molly Peters and Vicki, and then for Ashley Stamps and the baby, continue prayers for them, for Don and uh, Becky Russell, for Elizabeth Prosper, and she mourns the death of her husband, Dr. Dave. Uh, for Christian and Brian Russell Taylor, who are Taylor Russell, who are uh, having to deal with a lot of family illness with Rebecca and Nicholas. So let's uh, keep them in our prayers. Uh, for Bobby and Mary Ruth, who are still down the valley, for peace in Israel and the Gaza Strip, and for peace, uh, prayers of peace in Ukraine and Russia. And then for Peyton President, who is serving in the military. Are there other places for other folks? Well, that's the chief army. Yes. He's having trouble breathing. And you're quite concerned. Yeah. So let's uh, let's keep Arby Wager in our prayers. Arby has been in and out of the hospital for the last few weeks, and. Uh, it's, uh, it, I mean, he's, uh, he's having a struggle, so let's um, pray that God will uh, place his healing spirit upon him and uh, make him whole in God's way and in God's time. Yes, uh, On Deborah Cowan's mother, they said that she's basically needed to go home on hospice. Uh, did, did, that, did I get the last name wrong? No. You no. Can. So it's Deborah Cowan? Yes. Okay. And I don't know the mother's name. Okay. So... Yet. Yeah, let's. Uh, let's and I have another friend, Karen Green. He's not doing well. She's uh, been uh, admitted back to MD Anderson. So, yeah. Karen Green. Yeah. Okay, let's remember her in our prayer. <coughs> and for Deborah Cowan's mother, who's been sent home on hospice. That has to be hard to hear. Yeah. Are there others that we want to lift up? Oh, we want to remember uh, Loretta and Les, who are traveling. And uh, to remember Bonnie and got to spend the weekend with her sister and the baby, the coming baby, I guess it is. So let's keep them in prayers. All right. God knows for those prayers that are most precious to you that you can only whisper before his burning grace in times of silent meditation. So let's take a moment of silent meditation and offer those prayers to God. Let's pray. <coughs> Jesus, keep us near the cross, where that fountain flows, where we can find healing, strength, and a new hope. We come before you this morning knowing that there is something right in front of us. It is that power, that presence, that we can draw from in our states of weakness and struggle. It is that abiding presence that comforts us in our sorrows. It is that presence that helps us through our sufferings. And this morning, O oh Lord, as we come before you, we bring all that we have and all that we are, and we lay it at your feet. 
And Lord, for those things that we have not been thankful for, forgive us. And we pause this morning to thank you for those things. For life. For shelter. For sustenance. For the abilities to go to work. We thank you for all the many things that you place in our lives that we are not always mindful of. We pray this morning that as we come before you, we may not take for granted one thing that you lay in front of us, but may be thankful for more things. We lift up the joy of the hope of going to medical school for Ashley, and we ask that you watch over her application and those that are there who are in medical school and will be going. We ask that you will be with them. Be with her as she awaits the coming day. We pray that you would comfort the Roseburg family and that they might feel your comforting arms around them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for the healing of Rebecca, and Linda Kay, for Donna, for Cheryl, for Loretta, for Woody and Thelma, for David Callum's mother, for Arby, for Susan, for Jason, for Mildred, for Martha, for Nicholas, Karen, Glenn, Bubba, Ronnie, Jimmy. Casey, Lucy, and Bruno. Lord, you know each and every one of their needs, even before their names have left our lips. So, Lord, send your angels of healing to walk with them in their time of illness and strengthen them in their weakness, give them courage in their uncertainty, and follow them all the days of their lives, and be with their families and undergird them all with your strength. And may they feel that presence and know and experience the peace that only you can give. We also pray, Lord, that you would be with the doctors and nurses and guide them in all their deliberations and decisions. We lift them all to you, their families and their loved ones, into your arms of mercy. I ask that you would watch over them and continue your good work in them. Lord, whatever that work may look like in the end, give us strength to accept it and know you are there with these loved ones. We pray for your presence to be with Molly, Vicki, Ashley, and the baby, for Becky and Dawn, for Elizabeth, for Christian, and for Molly. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with them that they would feel your presence all around them and experience not only your presence, but your peace in that presence. We pray for those who are traveling, and Lord, as they are away, we ask that you would watch over them, but that you would bring them safely back in your time. We pray for the peace of Israel and the Gaza Strip, and for Ukraine and Russia, Lord. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to touch the hearts of those who are leading the fights, that you would break their hearts of the death and destruction that they are all causing, that that would change them in some way, Lord, and they would find peaceful solutions to their problems. And Lord, use us as instruments of grace and peace to not only pray, but to truly work towards peace in our communities. We pray for Peyton Presnell, who is serving in the military, Lord, and we pray for not only him, but for all of the men and women, wherever they may be serving, that your hand might be upon them, keeping them safe from harm's way, and that you would return them home safely in the coming. We ask now, Lord, that you would help us to pray the prayer you taught your disciples, that as we pray it, we may pray it in all of its power and experience all of its grace. As we pray with one heart and one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to turn in your red candles to page 752, and there you will find the 22nd Psalm. And we are going to have a rather lengthy reading this morning, but I invite you to please stand if it's comfortable to do so as we read this response. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my room? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yet you, the praise of Israel, are enthroned in holiness. In you our forebearers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and by other people. All who see me <coughs> at me. They may be lost in the name. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him. For the Lord delights in him. Yet it was, was you who took me from the womb. And kept me from my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a post posture, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. death. Indeed, dogs surround me. A company of evil doers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stand all over me. They divide my garments among them. And the remnants they cast, cast lots. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who worship the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. At the ends of the earth shall remember all I'm sorry, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship the Lord. For the dominion belongs to the Lord who rules over the nations. All who sleep in the earth shall bow down to the Lord. All who go down to the dust shall bow before the Lord, and I shall live for God. Prosperity shall serve the Lord. Each generation shall tell of the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Surely the Lord has done it. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of God's words. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God, let us all say. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Mark, the 8th chapter, the 31st through the 38th verses. Jesus has just healed the blind man in Bethsaida, and Peter has confessed who Jesus is, and now Jesus is going to turn the conversation a bit dark. And as he, as he turns it dark, he says some things that may uh, not what Peter and the other disciples want to hear. But I want you to hear anew the word of God. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind things of God, but things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, 
If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us all say Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. You know, last week we talked about the catch and release program of the Holy Spirit and how it was placed into Jesus' life at His baptism. Remember that He caught the Spirit and then the Spirit pushed Him out into the desert or the wild or wilderness, as it says, and then released Him to be tempted by Satan. However, Jesus was not alone in the wilderness for a while. Rather, the Spirit accompanied Him it helped him as he faced each of the temptations. Likewise, when we catch the Spirit and we release it in our lives, something extraordinary happens. Not only in our lives, but in the lives of other people. Here too, when we allow the Spirit to be released in our lives, we, we know that there is something standing with it, that God is standing with us, and that we are never alone. And that alone should restore our healing, our hope, and our lives, even when we can't see God's hands upon us or with us. We know God is there. And when we commit ourselves to this catch and release program that God has allowed us to fully incorporate into our lives, we move closer to what God really wants us to be and fulfill His call in our lives. When the disciples fully released the Spirit in their lives, think what happened when He sent the 72 out, remember? And they said, we cast out demons and we heal people. You see, they allowed God to put His Spirit first in their lives. Nothing else mattered but the words that they spoke. In the beautiful rendition of The Chosen, I love how they sends out the the 12 at the very first. And you remember that as you see the different scenes, they're, a, they're not amazed at what happens, but each time they come back together, they're just kind of perplexed. What happened? How did this happen? What was the release of the Holy Spirit? And Jesus tells them, this is what happens when you give it all and you put all for God. Now this morning, we have a series of meditations that are leading us to the cross. Now, the disciples still didn't have a clear understanding of what Jesus meant here in our gospel lesson. So we need to be careful that we don't rush to try to clearly understand. Because, you see, we're a post-resurrection people. We know the rest of the story, right? But imagine if you are a first century Christian and Jesus starts talking like this. How do you imagine they might have felt? as they listened to his words that day. I think maybe some of them had some doubts, like, uh, what's he talking about? Uh, is this really what I want to sign up for? Uh, am I having second thoughts? You know, we've seen him do great things, and we've seen him do miracles, but now it's getting pretty dark here. He's talking about death. Here in our text, the cross and resurrection are held together in a very thin tension. For Jesus, he cannot separate the cross and resurrection. They will both happen. They will both happen to him. And it will change not only his life, but the life of those who believe in him. I wonder if Peter really could accept that tension of knowing that Christ was going to do something that would change his life so drastically. But 
And it also begs for us to ask the question, how do we stand when there is a tension between what is to come and what will be? If we really want to hear this passage anew, we need to step back and understand how the first century church understood the death, the cross, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. In this passion and resurrection tradition, and we see this thin wire that holds them together, we need to fully participate in the Lenten season by remembering in the hope Within despair, there is a, always a sign of hope. There is always something better coming. And Jesus' words are not veiled in mystery this morning. Rather, his words confront us in terms of what do we see in the story. And I say... That sometimes what we want to see and what we think we see are sometimes different. But there is always something right in front of us for us to see in Jesus' words and how he's teaching. In a sense, Jesus will redefine what it means to suffer in his disciples and their role and our role and what it means to suffer for Jesus. So what I would like for you to do this morning is to open your hearts and minds and consider the words of Jesus that we might learn the lessons that they do. Because sometimes it's right in front of us. So let's not miss it. Let's pray. O oh Lord, as we come near, open our hearts and minds and souls to hear anew the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. Still all the world's noises and give us peace in our souls as we hear your words and savor each one. Keep chewing us our faith and challenge us to grow, that we may become the incarnation of Christ to the world. Help us to step out of the way that you may use us as your vessels. Now, Lord, pour your words into my life, that I may share them with those you have sent to us today. Let me preach in your name and your name alone and by your Spirit, alone. Still all the other voices in me, that yours may be the only voice they hear and the words that they hear. We pray all this in the name of God, our Creator, Christ, our Redeemer, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, let us all say, Amen. Amen. So I want you to imagine we're sitting on the ground, and maybe that's why we have the back doors open this morning. So that we hear the rustle of the wind. We hear the birds every now and then. And we're sitting in a very different place other than our pews. Imagine kids running around and listening. Mothers trying to reach for their child as they run. Maybe we even have a little bit of confusion because we can't clearly hear all of Jesus' words. And maybe we think that as he speaks, maybe the words that he just spoke, maybe, maybe we just heard them wrong. Imagine that for just a moment. And then, imagine that, no, no, that's what he said. That he's going to go and be crucified. He's going to die. Does that sound like something you want to jump on board with? The first hearers of his word found this to be very strange, uncomfortable, frightening, uncertain. But now let's turn our attention to the audience post-resurrection in the first century church. Remember that the first century church believed that Jesus was coming back and that when he said he would return, they were looking in anticipation of Jesus coming back 
Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year. And their hopes were filled with this anticipation that something was going to happen. The fulfillment of his words would come in their lifetime. So when they read this passage, they read it very differently. Do we read this passage in anticipation? Or are we still just waiting? I believe sometimes that we lose the anticipation that the first century church had because it's been so long and we're still waiting. But I want to challenge you to say that no, we don't have to sit around and wait because God is already with us. Isn't that what Jesus means? Emmanuel, God with us? And if God is with us, and then He sends the power of the Holy Spirit down on Pentecost Sunday. Does that not mean that God is with us? So many times we remove God from our situations that we face, don't we? Why am I here all alone? Why doesn't anybody care? And we feel desperate, and we feel small and insignificant to God. But God counts us as significant. And we are not small in God's eyes. Because if that were so, Jesus would not have died, right? But Jesus came to save humanity. And He comes and he, we realize that the fulfillment of His kingdom is coming in the here and now. The fulfillment of his kingdom in the here and now is us working towards that kingdom, being a part, being instruments of grace in his hands. So when we change our longing for the return of Christ into anticipating as though he is already here, we change not only our lives, but the way and perspective that we take and look at life, daily life. Matt Skinner says our problem with seeing the passage in this vein is that theology oftentimes uh, retrospectively looking back on a passage and how it changes things. But what if we change our perspective to the fulfillment of Jesus' promise from the death and resurrection? How would that story read differently to us? Notice in verse 31, he says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and three days after rise again. So often when you get into seminary, they start teaching you Greek and they start teaching you Hebrew. And so you begin to start what they call exegete. You take the passage apart and... He said, you know, when you're a first-year student in seminary, you read it as we see it in our Bible, he must go through. Okay? But the first century hearers did not see it that way. It is necessary for the Son of Man to go through something. It is necessary. And there's something a little bit different between must and it is necessary, right? In our language. It is necessary that he, not everybody else, but he must go through the suffering. Oftentimes we hear it as the Son of Man must suffer and lead us into thinking that we must be just like Christ. We think that we must go through suffering in order to attain the cross. But is that true? Do you think we belong to a God that wants us to suffer? I don't think so. I think we have a God who, in Jesus Christ, came to redeem humanity and take the suffering away from us. Because I'm not sure that we're supposed to go present ourselves to the authorities, have them beat us, and nail us to the cross. There's something much different here. 
It is necessary for him to suffer because he must take on our sin. He must take on all of that stuff in our lives that we would rather cover up and keep from God. But remember, there's nothing hidden in God, right? And so what does he do? Jesus comes and he knows and he sees the brokenness of humanity and he takes it upon himself, on his back. And what does he open for us? New life. We no longer have to carry the burden of our sin and our shame. No, he releases it from us. As another commentator said, you know, when we think about the suffering of Jesus and him calling, uh, you know, and, and maybe Peter thinking that, oh, he wants us to sunlight, he says, woohoo, how many of us want to go suffer? He's right. There's not one of us, but we have one who did. And take that on. And when we hear Peter's response in verse 32, it's kind of a natural response because it's our human response, right? Wait a minute. Uh, you're not the kind of leader we thought you were going to be. Weren't you going to come out and keep the Romans out so that we could start self-governing again and make everything all better? Weren't you the one that was going to come and perhaps set everything straight in the temple? And so now there would be a re-establishment of Israel and its, and its understanding of its, of its past and of its future and that we would be held in God's hands and we alone would be okay. But then Jesus starts talking to Gentiles at a well. He starts reaching out to the people that aren't supposed to be in the kingdom. And I think what Peter is saying in really human terms is, Stop it! Don't say that! And what did Jesus say Get behind me, Satan. Jesus is neither dismissive nor kind in his response to what he tells Peter. Because Jesus is focused on the redemption of humanity. Peter is looking for the redemption of humanity on earth. His thing is about taking care of what's theirs. And yet, Peter is looking at the church and the future of the church and the future of what's going on through his own eyes and not God's eyes. It's easy to do that, isn't it, in our world? We see things through our own eyes. We make judgments. We make statements. And we tend to have on blinders. But that's not Jesus, is it? Jesus opens his eyes and he sees the full of humanity. It's suffering and it's pain. What Jesus is calling Peter and the other folks to is something that is really hard to do. And he confirms it in verse 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up my cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Right in those simple that simple passage right there, Jesus marks for them a new way to understand what he's just saying. About he, as I said a moment ago, missed it. It is necessary for him to suffer. Yes, it is necessary for Jesus to suffer. But he changes that statement around for us. He said, instead of you taking on the suffering, look at the suffering all around you. Now, folks, would you believe in our world today that people are suffering in the 21st century? How many of you believe that? Raise your hand. There are. There are people suffering from illness. There are people suffering from broken relationships and families. There are people suffering from all a milieu of things, right? Would you agree? 
And because they're suffering, we are to look for them. And we are to be as Christ to them as Christ was to the people in his time that he saw suffering. A woman at a well going there in the midday sun because she's ashamed. And her community is ashamed of her and they do not even cast their eyes upon her. When she walks down the street, they turn their back on her. And what does Jesus do? He's sitting there at the well. And what does he do? Can you give me a drink of water? Imagine that perplexed, perplexed look on her, perplexed look on her face. What are you talking to me? You know, you know, you're not supposed to be talking to me. I'm, I'm an outcast. I'm a Gentile. You're a Jew. You shouldn't be talking to me. Jesus has just broken three cardinal rules. First of all, it's a man talking to a woman. Second of all, it's a Jew talking to a Gentile. And third, he is asking for something from them, from the unclean. But what he's saying in those simple two verses in 34 and 35 is to say, when you see suffering, whether it's spirit, physical, or spiritual, what are you going to do? Are you going to add to the suffering of that person? By judging them? By turning your back and by saying, you're not good enough for God and you're not good enough for me. Perhaps taking up the cross means or looks something like this. Look at the circumstances. Look at the things that are going on. Because sometimes it's right in front of us. Taking up the cross is less about our own pain and discomfort and addressing the suffering that sometimes we see right in front of us. Do we consider the suffering of those in our community? What are we doing to seek to root out the systemic problems that people are suffering through today? Are we working to a fuller, fuller understanding of what it means, justice for all? Or do we say it's just us? I wonder what happens if we work towards a fuller understanding of who God wants us to see. See, that's just it. Jesus always saw the suffering. And he never turned his back on them. And in fact, he knew that there was a young man suffering. And he goes to him, and the young man says, Hey, I, I want to come and follow you. What do I got to do? And Jesus knows what he's suffering from. He's suffering from having too much and too blinded to see the suffering before him. So what does he tell the young man? Go sell all that you have, give it all away, and come and follow me. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. And follow me. Sadly, the young man hangs his head and walks away. Christ came to relieve the suffering in our world. And with each circumstance that he saw, he entered in. And he entered in with grace, with mercy, forgiveness. Isn't that how he entered our lives when we were suffering? And some of you are going through your own sufferings right now. Do you not feel Christ with you? You are not alone. In fact, the Spirit is there speaking to you, holding you, sustaining you. Sometimes we need to understand the mission field anew. Because sometimes it's right in front of us. Our nation is sorely divided and God doesn't care who you want to blame, but he wants us to bend our hearts, to break our hearts, our hearts of stone, and to alleviate the suffering of others. For how can we alleviate suffering if there are we withhold mercy, grace, and forgiveness? And what does that say about the church? 
Perhaps Jesus is calling us to a sacrificial love, a sacrificial forgiveness, and grace. It's the balm that we need because that was the balm that was poured out on us and was given to us without cost, except for his death and resurrection. So I invite you to seek out all those in around you. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's, it's someone you see time and time again at the store or on your way to the store. And you see them and you, you see that long suffering in their eyes. Because sometimes it's right in front of us. Oh Lord, that you would open our hearts, minds, and souls. That we might be open and have the courage to speak your words of healing and hope. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my church said. Amen. I invite you to please stand as we say together our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 in your red hymnals. Let us unite our hearts and voices in this historic creed of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to turn in your uh, in your faith we sing hymnals to the song "Living for Jesus." And if you want to just get get the uh, small version, uh, you can read uh, find it in your uh, coaster, you know, number 173. And I believe there are four verses, correct? And we are going to sing all four verses. And yes, we're going to sing the chorus. This is a wonderful song of old. It's a song of faith. It is a song that we need to sing today, for this is who gives us life and breath each day.
let us pray. Almighty God, giver of all good things and all blessings of life, this morning we come to return to you a portion of that which is in front of us. Help us to remember that sometimes what you have is right in front of us, Lord, to serve and to do. So, Lord, use these gifts that we may transform lives, not only in this community, but throughout the world. And, Lord, use us. Use us as your instrument of love, forgiveness, and hope to take into the world and to whisper those words of mercy and life that all might claim you as Savior. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for who you are in our lives, and we ask that you bless the gift and the giver of each gift, that their cups may overflow, and they may offer a drink to those who are, suffer who are suffering and thirsting for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us all say, Amen. <laughs> Church say, Amen. 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 